break into the wild and don't be afraid. Run into wide open spaces, places waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted, places waiting.
when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room.
go of those chains, let go of those chains when all dead men yeah. Jesus, we praise you. We thank you that you take dead things and bring life to them. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul said, this is why we constantly thank God because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you welcomed it not as a human message but as it truly is the word of God. You received it not just human words we received it as the Word of God. And there's a difference, there's a big difference between just hearing a man speak or hearing the Word of God speak to your heart. And it says it also works effectively in you who believe. In you who believe. The Word of God works in and through our life when we believe. It's believing that a supernatural miracle takes place in your life. When you believe, when you trust, when you let that come into your heart, the word that God has spoken to you. And he led me this verse this morning before church, Romans 16, 16, verse 20. The God of peace, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The God of peace will soon crush, crush, crush Satan under your feet. That place where there's turmoil, that place where things have been robbed and stolen from you, the place that the enemy has tried to keep you back from. It says that God's not going to come in disaster, but he's going to come in peace. And he's going to crush Satan under your feet. Amen? Father, we pray today for those things, those obstacles, those oppositions, that place of oppression that comes against us. We thank you that your word speaks life over us. Your word has resurrection power in it. And we ask you, God, would you come in your peace? And would you crush Satan under our feet? Those demonic things that try to keep us back, that hold us back, that bring confusion, we ask you that you would crush them. We receive your word today into our hearts. We ask you that you would strengthen us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Come on, give God praise this morning. Just say hello to someone before you find a seat today.
Today is step three of the growth track. Step three is all about leadership. Everyone thinks they know what leadership is, but you may be surprised about how God calls leaders. If you have not taken step three and you wanna grow in your leadership, you can be part of the class today. And if you haven't taken step one or two, don't worry, you can still take step three. We will dismiss for the class in a few minutes. Good morning. How are you guys? I got one person, too. Great. I'm glad you're doing well. It's good to be here. It's one of my favorite days of the week, in case you didn't know. Now, oh, speaking of my favorite things, I want to know a couple of yours. So I very, uh, grab your connection card because I need you to hold it and grab a pen because I need you to have space to write down the three things that I want to know. Okay? I want to know three things from you, your favorite things, three of them. I will let you know exactly which ones. You ready? Everyone has their pen and their paper? Good. Number one, I want to know what is your favorite way to spell your name? Okay, start with the first letter, then the next one. Hey, and if they're silent letters, put them in there too, if they're supposed to be. If they're not, leave them out because you don't need them. They're silent. Okay, first, your name. Your first favorite, your favorite way to spell it, okay? Number two, your favorite way to get mail, okay? Do we like mail at our house? your address, or do you prefer to get your mail emailed to you online? Email address, okay? One of those two. Favorite way to get it? Write it down in your connection card, please. And number three, I want to know when is your favorite date to spend eternity with Jesus? When do you want to start that? Do you want to start that 20 years ago when you did it? Or do you want to start it today because you haven't yet? Whenever you're ready, I'd love for it to be today, if you haven't, of course. But we'll go ahead and write the date on the back of your connection card. You can, like, fill in the circle. I'm pretty sure it's already dated for you because who cares about the date? It's the 15th, in case you wanted to know. Okay, we're talking about living forever with Jesus because that's one of my favorite things to do because I'm doing it, and you obviously can't stop once you've started, but that's a whole other thing. We're going to read a Bible chapter because verses are too short, so we're going to read the whole chapter. Are you ready? We're going to read Psalms 133. Starting with verse 1. How good and pleasant is it when brothers live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on the beard of Aaron, running down upon his collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. From there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Life forevermore is a blessing from God. And when you are living in unity with other believers, those who believe the same things as you, you get life forevermore, everlasting life. And that is so exciting. I'm super pumped about it. Because as soon as you accept Jesus into your heart, you are part of that body living forever, and all you have to do is live in unity with others. That's other people who believe the same thing as you. Not that difficult. Doesn't matter what they look like, what they wear, what they've done in their past. They believe in Jesus and they have accepted him as their savior, and you have, so we can agree. There's no fighting, okay? Now, that we know that we can all live together peacefully in unity, because we are believers, and we uh, like each other, okay? We can finish filling out our connection cards with your three favorite things, because I want to know them, and if you have offering or tithes that you'd like to give to Jesus today, you can put those in your envelope, or click the link online, and you can put those envelopes and connection cards in the baskets at the back of the room at the end of service. Before we leave, though, I would love to pray for you. So you can close your eyes if you close your eyes when you talk to God. Jesus, we thank you that you are the God that fights for us, that we can come together in understanding because we believe in the same thing. We believe in you, and we believe that you love us no matter where we've been or where we've come from and that we are all going to the same place. We are all going to live forever with you if we've accepted you and choose you, God. And because we've chosen you, we to live in unity and you fight for us because you are the best God. We love you and you are the only God who can do what you do. We love you. We love you, God. Amen. Now. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to go to Growth Track, today is step three, the third one. And if you haven't taken one or two, that's okay. You can take three and then take one and two in the next month, okay? So you can go to Growth Track right now. And if you're in Grounded, which is our junior high class, you can go to Grounded right now. And we'll see you down there. Have a wonderful service. Watch this video.
Good morning, everyone. Pastor Chris here to let you know what's happening right here at Grace. Kids and youth, our last day for Wednesday night ministry will be May 18th. But for youth only, road trips will start June 8th. Couples, Big Igloo Adventures is hosting a date night out on Friday, May 20th. The highlight of the night will be watching It's a Bad Year for Tomatoes at the local community theater, and this event will be free to you. However, there is limited seating, so talk to your significant other and get signed up. Attention all new or newish people at Grace, we will be having a meet and greet with the pastoral staff of Grace Sunday, May 22nd at 1 p.m. Again, if you are new this year or last year, please join us. Oh yeah, there'll be dessert too. It's that time of year again. Super Kids Camp is coming June 20th through the 24th, and we need your help. We need all hands on deck so we can minister to the hundreds of kids who will come this summer. You can sign up as staff or look at other various needs such as water, candy, housing, food, and much more. And lastly, you students, Bold is right around the corner, and you do not want to miss out. There will be great speakers and worship such as Gable Price and Becky Johnson from Jesus Culture. And yes, we will cap off our bold experience with a day at Worlds of Fun. That's all I have for you guys today. And remember to sign up or learn more about any of these events. You can visit the website at carneygrace.com. Be blessed. Have a great rest of your week. Good morning. God is good all the time. Amen. Hey, it's uh, graduation weekend, uh, last weekend, this weekend, and uh, I know Carney High's graduation is today, and so we just want to congratulate all the seniors that have graduated and that are moving on to this next phase in their life, and we're just uh, excited for you. God's got a great adventure in store, a great adventure. We, All of us that have been through it, we're part of the great adventure, right, we've been in, and um so we're excited about that, and we're just happy for you that you're taking the next step in life. Hey, I want to uh, uh, start a new series with you today, and um, I, I want to share some things about coming alive, and, and maybe even today, maybe awaken some things in you. Um, a few weeks ago, I was, I was at a conference in uh, Washington, D.C. called Voice of the Prophets, and, and um, I just really felt um, some urgency on a word from the Lord and uh, I'm going to share a little bit of that and then, then with some of my things in here. And, and uh, it's a word that uh, I felt was strong enough for this season that uh, I wanted to share it with our congregation. And so I'm going to do it in three parts uh, over the next three weeks and share some things about coming alive. If you want to grab your Bible down by uh, the chair there, and if you want to turn to John chapter 11, it's, in, uh, it's on page 610. And uh, there's a highlighter in the chair back in front of you if you want to grab that. And somewhere, when I read this passage here in a little bit, if you'd like to highlight something that just sticks out to you, it's like, wow, that's kind of interesting. And uh, just something that jumps out to you, just highlight that. It'll, it'll spark some interest in somebody that might pick up this Bible later. And if you're here today and you don't have a Bible, take that one home, would you? Just take that Bible home and, and you'll see some things that maybe somebody else has already marked in there uh, of something that stuck out to them. And, and uh, it might bring some life to you. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever gone back to a, a place, a town, um, a city that you previously lived in? And when you go back to that place, how do you feel? How do, how do you feel when you go back? Crowd participation. How do you feel when you go back to somewhere? somewhere? It's excited. Some people feel excited to go back to a place that they've been before. What are some other things? Some people love it. Curious. What? Empty. Yeah, you can feel a little empty when you go back to a place, can't you? Like, something doesn't feel right. This isn't my place anymore, maybe a little bit. And uh, maybe a little awkward. Sometimes you go back to a place, you feel a little bit awkward. I ask these questions because I lived in lots of towns. I went to seven schools. And uh, sometimes going back to those places have great memories, and, and they have things that evoke uh, good or strong emotions in me. And other times I go back to some of those places, and I feel a little out of sorts or out of place. Like, wrong time, wrong season, wrong place. And uh, just not quite right. Um, and uh, so I just want to think about it a little bit. How about like uh, class reunions? How many of you like to go back to class reunions? Some of you do. Some of you. Why do you like to go back to class reunions? 
see friends. Maybe you had some good experiences or good things. How many of you do not like to go back to class reunions? Look at the hands go up. Lots of them. Why is that? Because sometimes it wasn't a good experience. There were things you don't want to remember, and those people you met in junior high, you wish they stayed in junior high. <laughs> and sometimes that's kind of hard. So I, I went to three high schools and um, didn't really, because of that, didn't really find a place in any of those. And so I've never gone back to any of those class reunions. And I've only been invited back to one of them. I probably would go back to the first one when I was a freshman because that's where I spent the longest amount of time, sixth through ninth grade. Um, but, you know, it's a little awkward. You know, I, I don't know a lot of those people. I didn't, I didn't have that length of relationship with them. And so a little bit different. So when you think about places you've left, sometimes we leave a place because um, it, it, had, it had good memories. And we left, God called us to something else that we went to. Other times we leave a place that was a little more difficult and we had some struggles and it's just got some strong negative emotions and it might keep us from going back to a place. And so I want to talk to you about that a little bit today and um, maybe that God wants to bring some life to some things that have been dead in us. I'm not telling you you have to go back to a class reunion, <laughs> but, but there's some other things. There, there was a time, I remember several years ago, when the Spirit of God uh, just did this amazing thing in my life. I was uh, here at church, and I was supposed to go to this business, this place of business, and uh, I kept trying to go there, but there was something kept stopping me from going all day long. It's like, I got to get there. I got to get there. You ever have one of those experiences like it's on the checklist? I got to get there. Something just trivial that you have to do. I just had a trivial exchange. I had to take place at this business, and it just kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed. And finally, at the end of the day, like at five o'clock, I finally had time I could go over there. And so I went over there, and um, I had this amazing encounter. One of the greatest, the, the beginning of one of the greatest miracles I've ever experienced in my life life. Literally a miracle. I should not have been there at that time. I tried to go there four different times. And when I was there, I ran into a guy uh, that I had not seen for years who lived in a different town in a different, different state. Somebody completely, it was like, and, and so they just popped up on the checkout aisle on the other side. And I was like, what are you doing here? Like, and he was like, what are you doing here? <laughs> And so we stepped out in the aisle, and, and for about 45 minutes, the Holy Spirit just arrested us in that place. It was like we were just in this, like, vortex. <laughs> this exchange was going on. He was pouring his heart out to me, the things he was struggling with in life, and, and the places he'd been, and the hardships he'd been through. And, and uh, he just, he, he lived 10 or 12 hours away from there. And, and he came up, he was staying with some friends, and he was just trying to find life again. And the Holy Spirit had us have this encounter that I, I tried to get to that place four other times that day. But that was the divine appointment God had. Next week, I, I invited, he was gonna be around for a couple weeks, so I invited him to church. The next week, he came to church, and we had a guest speaker that was actually preaching and sharing and shared the message of the gospel, shared the freedom and life that can come with Jesus. And not just about knowing about somebody, but actually seeing the word of God come alive, like I read out of 1 Thessalonians earlier, that it has life in it. And um, this guy asked, hey, if anybody wants to give their life to Jesus, uh, I want you just to come down here. And this guy was sitting right over there, and he got up and made his way over here, and he encountered Jesus for the first time in his life. He knew about religion, but he encountered Jesus. And this man was, was, had lots of addiction in his life. And in the altar, that later he thought he was there about five minutes, it was a 45-minute exchange where we prayed for this man. People had left, service was over, and he went through deliverance, and he was set free that day from drug addiction, from alcohol addiction, in a moment's notice. One of the greatest miracles I ever experienced started with a random chance encounter at a business. It wasn't random at all, was it? It was on appointment by God. A one of the greatest miracles. God, that place, like, like that business in town, every time I go to that business, I think about where I was standing. They've rearranged that business, they've moved things around, but I could go to that spot where a great miracle took place. Started and finished right here at the altar. This dead man came alive in a moment. In just a moment, he came alive. It's one of the greatest miracles I've ever experienced in my life. And so I want to read to you about a great miracle today out of John chapter 11. So if you have your Bible, if you found it, if you got that place, 
John chapter 11. So we're going to read a lot of verses here. We're going to read 44 verses, which is a lot. If the, so surely there's something that might just pique your interest. If there's something that you're like, hey, that's interesting, just highlight that. It might be the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. And um, I just want to read about this story about a man named Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. Now, Jesus was good friends with this family. Mary, Martha, and, G- and Lazarus, you read several different things in the scriptures about this family, and, um, and, and they were pretty close to him. And so I just want to take note of a few things. So it says this, now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Now Bethany is just a few miles from Jerusalem, not very far out, a little small town. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet her, his feet with her hair. Remember you reading that story a few weeks ago, if you were here, about Mary who, who had this perfume that was worth how much? A year's wages. Anybody got perfume sitting on their shelf that's worth a year's wages? And if you had it, would you break it out and pour it out over somebody's feet? But it was an act of worship where she was just laying everything down at Jesus. She was worshiping for who he was, preparing him for where he was going that she didn't even know what was about to happen. So we're talking about that, Mary. And it says this, and it was her brother, Lazarus, who was sick. So the sisters sent a message to him, Lord, the, love, the one you love is sick. Now, if somebody sent me a message and said, hey, Mitch, the one you love is sick, well, what would you think about? Is it my wife? Because I love her. Is it my kids? Is it, who's the one I love? But Jesus knew. They knew that Jesus loved Lazarus. And he knew it came from Mary. Hey, the one you love is sick. You could have put just about any name in there, right? Because who are the ones that God loves? For God so loved the world. He loves us all. He, he, you could put your name in there. Though. If you're sick, you could say, hey, God, maybe on the behalf of somebody else. Hey, Lord, on the behalf of Greg, hey, the one that you love is sick. Hey, God, on, on behalf of Nikki, she, the one you love is sick. You ever just lift to God? God, hey, Lois, the one you love, she's sick. What are you going to do about that? <laughs> All right, I'll keep moving. When Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness will not end in death, but is for the glory of God. The sickness won't end in death, but is for the glory of God. Sometimes we go through things and we don't know why we went through it, but here Jesus says, it's for my glory. It's for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Jesus would be glorified. Sometimes we've gone through really hard things. Nobody wants to go through hard things, but sometimes we have. When we go through hard things, it is so that God would be glorified, that God would be lifted up. Verse five, now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he didn't run there and get there immediately, like we probably would have, but he stayed in Bethany for a couple more days. (laughs) It's not what we usually do, is it? But he stayed there in the place where he was. Then after that, he said to the disciples, verse seven, let's go to Judea again. Verse eight, Rabbi, the disciples told him, just now the Jews tried to stone you and you wanna go there again? Aren't there 12 hours in a day, Jesus answered, if if anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks during the night, he does stumble because the light is not in him. He said this and then he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I'm on my way to wake him up. Jesus was on mission. Then the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll get well. Jesus, however, was speaking about his death. But they thought he was speaking about natural sleep. So when Jesus, so Jesus then told them plainly, Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that, he's telling this to his disciples, so that you may do what? Believe. So that you may believe, let's go to him. Two days have passed. Jesus said, hey, it's good that I wasn't there because you're gonna believe now. You haven't believed in me yet, you're gonna believe now. Then Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too so that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, less than two miles away. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary remained seated in the house. And then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And she had faith. She was not happy. She was frustrated, but she still had faith. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. 
And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. In other words, when, when God re- resurrects us all, I know he'll rise then. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? It's a great question for each and every one of us. Jesus says he's the resurrection and life. And he says this, the one who believes in him, even though you might die physically, will live. Spiritually, you're gonna stay alive. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? It's a good question for you today. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. You, you see, I'll just pause for a minute. Finding, finding hope in life through Jesus isn't about all the religious hoops, it's about believing in Jesus. When you believe in him, that's the transformation that took place for this guy at the altar where everything changed in his life. It's resurrection power. Resurrection power. We sang about resurrection power a lot this morning. It's resurrection power. Yes, Lord, verse 27, she told him, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes into the world. Having said this, she went back and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here calling for you. As soon as Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And the Jews who were with her in in the house, consoling her, saw that Mary got up quickly and went out. And so they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to cry there. As soon as Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. That's kind of, Lord, where were you at when this tribulation came? God, where were you at when disaster came upon me? God, where were you? When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying, He was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him, he asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. And so he went to the tomb and Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there is already a stench. He's been dead for four days. Verse 40, Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you what? Believed, you would see the glory of God. So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this so that they may believe you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out bound hand and foot with linen strips with his face wrapped in cloth. And Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. Unwrap him and let him go. Over the next three weeks, I want to take three powerful prophetic statements out of this chapter, out of these 44 verses. I want to encourage you with them. And uh, I believe it's a prophetic mandate for a season. And in this season, here's the three messages we're going to talk about. Let's go back to Judea. If you believe, you will see the glory and unwrap him and let him go. So don't miss that one in two weeks. Unwrap him and let him go. Listen, we're living in a very interesting time. Very interesting time we're living in right now. There are so many things being said. Even those who have prophetic voices in our nation and world are saying things that seem to be of polar opposites. It's kind of crazy. One voice is saying this. It's saying, we're about to embark on the greatest revival in history, a global awakening that's upon us, and we must be ready. There are people that are going to come to Jesus. They're going to believe in Jesus that have not. They're coming, and we got to be ready. And I believe that's a true word. There's a prophetic word that years ago that talked about in the last day revivals, there would be stadium crusades again. Stadium Crusades. In 2019, there was a stadium crusade in Orlando, Florida, where 60,000 people gathered for, for uh, I don't know, like 18 hours, 16 hours that day to worship God and to pray for our nation. There was a man who saw that happen. And it was, I think it was called The Sind. And there was a man that was there. He saw it. His name was Lamar Hunt that owns the Kansas City Chiefs. And Lamar Hunt came back and he told the organizers of that event, he said, next year I want that event in my stadium. Well, that was 2020 when COVID hit. And for two, la- two years, things have been delayed. But this weekend, yesterday, Arrowhead Stadium was filled with believers. Thousands of people filled with believers 
worshiping God. There, it, and it's a precursor of what we're going to begin to see. There are great things happening among us. And that, that is one voice. But then there's another prophetic voice that says what? Disaster's coming. Food shortages are coming. You need to prepare, right? That's the other voice. What do we do with those two voices? Well, first thing is you have to discern the voice of God. You have to, just because somebody said something doesn't necessarily mean it's true. What, does that bear witness with what the Spirit of God is saying in your heart that we're supposed to test and try and, and, and ask God, God, how does this apply to me and what do you want me to do? Don't just run and do something because somebody said something. Do something because it bears witness in your spirit. But in reality, both of those things can be true. Both those things can be true. There can be hardships that we go through, but yet at the same time, there could be some of the greatest revival that the church has ever seen in America and around the world, especially if we are nearing the last days, that there is a great revival that's among us, a great revival. But here, here's what I know. Here's what I know. That no matter what's happening, Jesus is still the hope of glory. Jesus is still the hope of glory, and the Spirit of God is still on this planet. No matter what you're going through today, Jesus is still the hope of glory, and the Spirit of God is still on this planet today. Amen? He's here. And so we can declare that we are going to see more people come to Jesus, because that's his heart that we ever had before. If you were in Europe right now, if you were in Europe right now, and, and refugees from the Ukraine were at your doorstep, if they were at your doorstep, would you be willing to take them in? Would you be willing? Would you be able to handle the inconvenience? Would you be ready to comfort and disciple them? Because it's happening today that these refugees are showing up in homes and, and in their kitchens, they, they start worshiping God and the people there are like, how can you worship God? You just lost everything. And they'll say, because I have a hope, the hope of glory, I have the hope of Jesus. Here's some video from Juan Carlos, who, who landed in Ukraine last Monday, sent me some video this morning, and this is a, pad, this is a one place where refugees are being, are, are being taken care of, and, and the supplies that are happening, some of the resources we sent to help. This pastor of this church is housing 9,000 refugees. 9,000 refugees one church is taking care of. What, what, what would we, I wonder what the church in America really would do if people really started to get saved, if, if, people, if God really started to move, now this is disaster and, and, and destruction taking place, but there is still hope. There's actually, there's actually a pastor's conference that Juan Carlos was at where there was like three, 200 pastors in this room in the middle of this war stuff going on where they were pressing in to say, God, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to do? And here's what I want to know. If the masses found Jesus, would you be able to handle the inconvenience? Would you be willing to disciple them? Would you create space for them in your life? Because if you do, God will send them to you. If you'll create space, God will send them. And most of us truly are probably unwilling to do this. It seems like a big inconvenience. We're like, can we just send them to a class to get discipled? But discipleship is not a class. Discipleship is a lifestyle. And for somebody who becomes a new believer, they need you to spend your life with them, to disciple them, to love them, to help them learn and grow, to help them reach other people. And some of us have just been on the sidelines unwilling to pour our lives out for anybody again. And I want to spend the rest of our time today looking at some dead things in our lives that possibly Jesus wants to bring back to life to come again in our lives. There are some things that have been dead. There are dreams that, that have died in our life that I think God wants to bring back in this next season. There are gifts that you operated in that you have not operated in for a long time because of something happened and there's been hurt and pain and rejection and so you stopped operating in them. And God says, I want to stir that bucket back up in you. There are some places that God wants you to go back to. I want to read this out of John chapter 11 again, these two obscure verses that most of us probably have read over a thousand times and never paid a lick of attention to. And it's this in verse seven and eight. After that, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. Let's go to Judea again. And then it says, Rabbi, the disciples told him, just now the Jews tried to stone you and you want to go back there again. Listen, this, there's a prophetic word being released today, and I'm going to preach this a little bit different, because I want to help awaken the thing that's been dead in you and bring it to life. 
Let's go back to Judea again. I, I want to encourage you with this, that, that God is in the restoration business. He likes to restore things, to bring them back to their original intent. And some of you have walked in gifts, you've walked in things that you've just let lay because you feel like, well, either I went through a really hard thing and I can't be used that way anymore, or I'm just too old. And I want to tell you, both of those are a lie. They're a lie. You're not too old. You're not too old. One, one of the most, uh, I was thinking about this, this yesterday as uh, I, I played some golf with my father-in-law, who's um, 86 years old, just turned 86, and we played golf. We're gonna play again today. We played golf. And I was just thinking, man, I don't know how many 86-year-olds are out here playing golf who believe they can still do something. He may not hit the ball as far, but he still hits it. And he still hits it straight, which I don't. <laughs> he probably still beat me today. Listen, a lot of us have given up on things, but God wants to restore them. He wants to bring them back to the original creation. He wants to bring it back to use in our life. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verse 10, there's a verse that says this. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have what? Suffered a little while. Now, I know, like, I, I like to operate out of faith. I don't like to embrace too much suffering. <laughs> right? We, none of us really like to embrace too much suffering. We like to, we like to maybe just, just kind of take those suffering verses and like, did you really say that, God? <laughs> we don't like the hard things that we go through. But here's the thing. After you've suffered a little while, I'm going to restore, establish, strengthen, and support you. I mean, I mean, Jesus could have relieved a lot of pain from Mary and Martha by not waiting a few days to go back to Bethany. They suffered a little while, didn't they? Why? Because he was about to perform the greatest miracle he'd ever performed to that day. To raise somebody from the dead. He was about to perform a great miracle. Sometimes there's a little suffering that has to go on before we experience the great miracle that's about to take place. Don't let anybody tell you you can't when God has called you to it. Some of us have given up on things that we weren't supposed to give up on. And listen, you're, listen, today, not all of you, some of you are gonna have something light inside of you that's gonna call you back to Judea, to go back to that place that you've left, to go back and embrace that thing again. God's gonna call you to go back to Judea and there's gonna be life there where there was death. There's gonna be, there's gonna be freedom where there were some hard things that you went through before, some rejection, some persecution, some things that didn't work out very well. And so you ran out of that place, but there's gonna be an opportunity to go back to Judea. And you're gonna have some voices that are gonna tell you that's foolish, don't do that, I wouldn't go there. Don't you remember what happened last time just like the disciples told Jesus? What did they say? They said, Jesus, we were just there and the Jews had stones in their hands and they were hurling them at you. Why would you go back to that place? You, you're gonna have people, some of you, you know you've been called to go back to a place and some of you haven't gone back yet because there's somebody saying, why would you go back there? Somebody hurled stones at you before. Why would you go back there? Why would you go back? Why go back to that place? Listen, Jesus didn't go back to relive the trauma. Jesus didn't go back to rehash the past. He, that's not why he went back. Jesus didn't go back to reinforce a perpetual victimization status. That keeps us from going back. Where we, just, we play the victim card all the time. Jesus went back to perform one of the greatest miracles in his history. In the history, that's what he went back to do. He went back and resurrected somebody from the dead who had been dead for four days. He brought him back to life, something he'd never done before. Listen, we all have a Judea in our lives. We all have a Judea, the place where we experienced war warfare and possibly walked out with some wounds. That place that was really hard, there was some struggle, and we got wounded in that place. And it might not be a geographical place, but a spiritual place, a season, a relationship, an assignment where we experienced so much pushback for that season that we had to depart from that place. Where it was so hard, we were finally like, I gotta call it quits, I gotta be done. Even if it was just emotionally or spiritually or mentally. And for every season, for every place, for every relationship, for every assignment, God has a plan. And Satan has a scheme. 
There's a scheme that Satan has, but God has a plan for you. He's got a plan. And that scheme that Satan has usually involves obstacles, opposition, and oppression. It usually involves those things. Obstacles are kind of like mountains that we got to work our way around. It's like a mountain got thrown up in front of me. I was headed down, and all of a sudden, the big stop sign was there in this form of a mountain, and I didn't know what to do. A big obstacle that kept you from going forward. For some of us, we stopped because the opposition was too strong. It was like a big gate had just landed in front of us, and we couldn't get through the gate. And for others, the oppression was so heavy that it was like you were locked in a cell full of iron bars and there was no way out. Obstacles of mountains and, and, and gates that seemed like opposition and bars locked you up in a place of oppression. In those things, I believe God wants to remove in our life. We all have a Judea in our life. We all have one. And I want to go back to that place that they kicked me out of. I want to go back. Listen, here's a statement I hope it just resonates in your spirit today and as I say it a few times that it rolls around inside of you that I believe that God wants us to go occupy the very area that hell tried to kick you out of. That very place. That God wants you to go back and occupy that place where it seemed like there was so much oppression and you got kicked out of it that God wants to go back to that place that was dead and bring life to it. It may not be a physical place or, or a place like that. It may not be going back and doing the same job again, but God wants to call you back to the place where you were fruitful again. Some of you, when you got saved, you were tremendous evangelists and then you had so many naysayers and all of a sudden some opposition came and now you no longer evangelize. Some of you were great lights in your community and you, you, had built, you had built things in your neighborhood and built relationships and then all of a sudden some oppression came and you felt like you were locked up and so you walked out from that place. Well, I believe that God wants to bring you back to Judea. He wants to go back to Judea again. Yes, that place where people picked up stones and tried to throw them at you. He wants you to go back to, 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 to Judea. And when God tells you to go back, it's because he has anointed you. He's anointed you to unleash something new. That something new would take place there. He's anointed you to do what you had not done before. He doesn't want you to revisit the past. The past. He wants to unleash something new. When Jesus went back to Judea, he performed one of his greatest miracles ever. Listen, wherever there is a threat, when there is a threat, there is a miracle behind that threat. Whenever there is warfare, there is breakthrough behind that warfare. Wherever there is brokenness, there is a blessing behind that brokenness. Wherever there is an obstacle, there is an overflow behind that obstacle waiting for you in your life. And I want to tell you today, we're going back to Judea. We're going back to Judea. We want to go back to that place that hell has tried to keep you out of. We might be aware of what happened in the past, and Jesus was, but he said, we are going back. And today I'm declaring by faith that we're going back to occupy the very area that, is, that hell has fought to keep us out of. We want to go back and occupy that place again. I feel like this is a prophetic word for the season. I felt so strongly about it a few weeks ago that God said you've got to release this to your people because people need to go back to that place again. You are about to do greater things in that same place that hell tried to kick you out of before. You are about to serve as a conduit for Christ to save, deliver, and heal friends and family members in that very area that you were pushed out of. I believe there is a season coming to go back, to go back to Judea, to go back and win the battle. And I, I don't know if you're getting this at all. I don't know if it's even resonating in you. I, some of you are like, I don't even know what you're talking about, Mitch. But I want to tell you there's a Judea in your life that the Holy Spirit's going to light up and he's going to say it's okay, you can go back. And there's going to be all the voices that tell you not to. But God's got a plan. He's got a great miracle waiting to happen. Maybe this is resonating in your spirit. Maybe you're starting to grab a hold of this idea that maybe I could go back and occupy and see what I never, never saw in that same area I was attacked before. Listen, here's, here's some things. Maybe, maybe you don't understand what I'm saying. Here's, here's a few things. If your Judea is your children, some of us, a lot of us in this room, we got a Judea with our children. Our relationships have been broke down. They're not what they were before. But I want to tell you, you're about to see the glory of God with your children like you've never seen it before. Some of you are about to see the glory of God. And so you got you to change how you're looking at that relationship with them. you got to start asking God, God, would you help me to see what you see? 
Because right now there's a lot of suffering and there's a lot of pain. And I want to tell you, you're about to see the glory of God with your children you've never seen before. If your Judea is your marriage, you're about to see God show up in your marriage like never before. Some of you have already lived this out. Some of you had your marriages in Judea and you thought it was over. And God has restored that above and beyond what your marriage was before. Amen? I call a few of you out in the room, but I'm not going to. Because God has restored. God's worked a miracle. He brought you back to Judea, that thing that you were going to give up on. There was too much pain and suffering. Why would I go back there? And God worked a miracle in the midst of it. Maybe your Judea is your city, your community, your generation, that you might see the glory of God like you've never seen it before. Going back to Judea. I'm going back to witness the salvation, deliverance, and healing of the people I know in the very area where the enemy tried to take me out. The enemy tried to take you out in some places and you're gonna see the salvation, deliverance, and healing of the Lord. The place where they tried to break you will be the place of your breakthrough. The place where they wounded you will be the place where God will do wonders through you. And the place of the mess will be the place of the greatest miracle to take place. The question is, do we believe that God brings dead things to life or not? Do we believe? Because everything we've read today is about your belief. And believing comes from knowing. Believing comes because God puts a deposit right here. There, there's a knowing, like faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God that's deposited in here. As God speaks, and it's the word of God that's written, it's the word of God that's released to us that sometimes it's just like, wow, I could grab a hold of that. And I know this is what God's calling me to do. And for some of you, God is stirring up a Judea in your life today. He's gonna stir it up. You may not even know what it is yet, but he's stirring it up. It's gonna be your place of a miracle. And it's not gonna go back and prove something. Jesus didn't go back to Judea to prove his haters wrong. He went to perform a miracle. You don't have to prove anyone wrong. You live as a testimony of the finished work of Christ to prove that the gospel is right. Judea is the place that we got kicked out of, that we got to go back and occupy and see God do greater things than ever happened before. Now, as Christians, there, here's a few places where our Judea might be. One is that we already are making it. That one of the Judeas is the education system. In the education of 2022, that big mountain, we're going to take the education back in our country. There, there's already a move at foot that we're going to go back to Judea, that place that we abdicated our responsibility, the place that it was too hard, and we backed off. We're going to go back and take it back. Amen. We're going to go take it back. Now, listen, it takes something to be able to do that. Morality and truth have been stolen. Depravity, destruction, and devastation is ruling over our children. The attempt to sexualize our children is simply perversion. It's just perversion. It, it, it's, it's a spirit. People are bound under a spirit. You have to know where your warfare is. But here's the thing. They kicked us out, and we need to rise up in truth and love. And love. I have to love people right where they're at that are just deceived. And we have to go back to the Judea of education in the name of Jesus. There's another one that's another big mountain. It's the government mountain of Judea. In the governmental system, we have to go back and influence political discourse. In, in Psalm chapter 89, it says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Righteousness and justice. Faithful love and truth go before you. Listen, we need to push back against the notion that we need to remain silent politically because of the idea that it divides people. You just gotta be quiet because it divides people. That is not being truthful. Quite the contrary, born again, spirit-filled Christians need to influence. And we have abdicated our ability to influence. And we have permitted donkey and elephant worshipers to dominate the landscape when the worshipers of the Lamb need to stand up in the name of Jesus and bring an agenda that's transformative. That's what we need to do. We need to be involved. We've abdicated it. 25 to 45 million Christians didn't vote in 2020 because they abdicated their responsibility. How many of you didn't vote last week in the primaries because you didn't think it mattered? Or you didn't have time for it? Or I just forgot because it's not a priority because the enemy wants to numb us to sleep till we don't have any involvement. Our job is to speak truth and love and be involved. 
as believers, we need to rise up and change the landscape of our nation, but we would rather not vote so we can still complain and criticize. That's what we want to do. But we have to go back to that Judea, and listen, it will not be easy. It's hard to go back into education and try to influence where where things are so distorted, but little by little, we can make headway. It's hard to go back into some of the government realms and feel like you're making any headway, but little by little, we can make headway. And God is doing things behind behind the scenes that we don't even know, that are amazing, but we have a part to play. You have a role to play in that. How about the entertainment mountain? How about entertainment? You know, in the early 1900s, Charlie Chaplin, he went to church every week at Angela's Temple with Pastor Amy Semple McPherson. The, all of the people in the early entertainment industry, they went to church. But we've, we've just like, not only have we let that mountain go, but we've just received everything they throw at us. All of the impurity, all the language, all the, all the lust, all the sexualization, we've just received it all. And we let it keep coming across our airways. And somewhere you have to make a stand and say, you know what, that's not righteousness, that's not justice, and that's not truth. It it, it said in Romans 16 that I read earlier about, I I just want to hit this for a minute. In Romans 16, where it said the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. You know what it says right before that? He says, I want you to be wise about what is good. Wise about what is good and yet innocent about what is evil. Innocent about what is evil. Us as believers, we're not innocent about what is evil. We've abdicated so many things. And then it says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That's That's a big piece to play. Complacent Christianity must come to an end. Thumb sucking, whining, moaning, complaining Christianity must come to an end. And the church must rise up to go back to Judea and occupy the very area that hell has tried to keep you out of. That's what God wants us to do. Listen, if you, if you know there's a Judea, maybe you don't even know what it is, but you're saying, hey, I want to go back to Judea. Like, make this declaration with me with your hand up. I'm going back to Judea. I'm going in with truth. I'm going in with love. I'm going in with righteousness, with justice, with a fresh anointing, with the Spirit of God. As for me and my house, we're going in. We're about to occupy the very area that hell has tried to keep us out of. I'm going back. I'm going back. Why should you go back? Amen, come on, amen. Why should we go back? Because you have an insurance policy. You have an insurance policy in the word of God to go back. We read this verse at the beginning of the year, Deuteronomy 20 verse four that says this. What's it say? 20 verse four, what's that say? It says, for the Lord your God is the one who does what? goes, he'll what, fight for you, he'll go with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. That's the insurance policy. In a matter of fact, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 31, the Lord is the one who will go before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or abandon you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. In Isaiah 52, it says, for you will not leave in a hurry and you will not have to take flight because the Lord is going before you and the God of Israel is your rear guard. Not only is God gonna go before you, but he's behind you. He's with you. When he calls you to go back, I'm not telling you just to go run back to Judea because it sounds good. Oh, I should just go back to that place where I, no. When the Holy Spirit says, now's the time, go back. And you know, listen, God, when he says that, that means he's going before you and he's behind you. And you have the presence of God with you who is gonna go with you to fight for you against your enemies. That's who, how you're gonna have with you. Isaiah 45, verse two, says, I will go before you and will level the mountains. What did I say about mountains? The mountain. That obstacle that's been put up in front of you that we feel like we have to go around. I will level the mountains and I will break down the gates. That opposition that came up against you when you were in that place of Judea, that gate that was there. 
and cut through the bars of iron, that oppression, that heaviness that weighs over you. God says, I'm gonna level the mountains, I'm gonna break down the gates, and I am going to cut through the bars of oppression, and you're gonna find freedom when you go back there. Listen, I believe the Lord is saying this, that in this season, I am leveling mountains. I am breaking down gates. I am cutting apart iron bars. I'm the God who levels the mountains. How do you get there? How do you get to that place? Where's the the Google map of how do I get back to Judea? Jeremiah 6 says this, stand at the crossroads and look. Listen, if if you get to that place at the crossroads, you don't know what, you gotta stop and look. You gotta take it and say, God, which, where am I supposed to go? And ask for the ancient path. There's a path that's been set aside for you. Listen, the path that you came out of is probably not gonna be the path you're gonna take to go back. And ask for the ancient paths. The word says if you'll ask for wisdom, you can have it. It's the greatest asking you can do is for the wisdom of God. Ask for the ancient paths and ask where the good way is and then walk in it. Travel down that road. Walk in it and you will find what? Rest for your souls. Listen, by the time you get home today, some of you are gonna find freedom. Sometime this week, God's gonna wake up a Judean within you. God's gonna begin to speak to you. Some of you are gonna find just relationships change instantly. I believe you're gonna see mountains level in the name of Jesus. You're gonna see gates broken down and you're gonna see bars removed. So you gotta get there. You gotta get to Judea. You gotta get over your past and get there. Some of us, we just gotta get over our past to get there. You have to get over the pain that was there to get there. You have to get over the shame and get there. You have to get over the rejection and get there. You have to get over the fear and get there. You have to get over the anxiety and get there. You have to get there so that you can occupy the very area that hell has tried to keep you out of where it will be restored in your life. Amen? Come on, stand with me. Listen, I want to finish this service by making a declaration. We've been singing about resurrection today. We've been talking about resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And you know what? For some of us today, we need to declare that we are running out of the grave. That we're going to run out of the grave. Come on, let's run out of the grave. Would you sing this song? I know it's new to you. Will you sing this song today to run out of the grave and come alive? Because we got to wake up. Hey. I'm running out of the way Sickness, get out of my way Cause there's healing, there's healing I'm running out of the way I'm running running out of the the way Stronghold, it's time time that you break
God, we thank you that you love us right where we're at, but your heart for us is to embrace the calling and the destiny you have over our lives. And Lord, there's some in the room that have walked away from their calling and their destiny because of the rejection, the pain, the hardship, the strife. There's some that that have been hurt so bad they've walked away from the calling. They've stepped away from the dream. And I ask you, God, if, if you are calling them to go back to that Judea, that you would speak loudly and clearly to their spirit, that they would know without a shadow of a doubt that they're going back to Judea to occupy that place that hell tried to keep them out of. And I pray for each of us, God, Lord, there's areas in each of our lives that maybe as believers, we've simply relinquished. We've kind of let go of. We've, we've become just numb to the society, society, and we've just begun to believe things that aren't even true. We've absorbed hurtful and harmful things into our lives. And I just want to say, God, I'm sorry. I, w- I want to turn from those things. I repent today. I want to be full of life. And I ask you, Lord, that those things that have been assigned over me for death, that they would be broken off. And Lord, that I would become fully alive for who you've called me to be. That I would be fully alive, that I would come alive in the light that you've called me to walk in. I don't want to miss opportunities to to have a random chance opportunity at at a restaurant that you have divinely appointed for me. I don't want to stay silent. Some of us have stayed silent because it didn't work and so we just got quiet. Lord, I don't want to stay silent. I want to love people. I want to point them to you. I want to see transformation take place in their lives. Father, we pray for the greatest revival in human history. We pray for the lost in our city. We pray for the lost in our schools. We pray for the lost in our government. We ask you, God, would you let the church rise up, that we would be the hands and the feet and the voice, the life and the love, encouraging people toward you. Help us to be all that you've called us to be. Lord, help us to come back to life and to walk in the resurrection power. Jesus, you asked Martha, you said, I'm the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in you would not die, but they would live. And you asked her, do you believe this? I tell you, Jesus, I believe it because you put it on my heart. If you're here today and you've never placed your trust in Jesus, if you've never said, yes, I believe, Jesus, you are the Savior, You can do that right now. It's what Nikki was talking about earlier. Right now, you can say, I want to place my trust in Jesus. And on that connection card, you can can mark off and you can write the date today, May 15th, 2022, I gave my life to Jesus. You can simply just say, Jesus, I believe in you. That's all your requirement was to believe. I believe in you, Jesus. Would you come into my life? Would you save me? Would you transform me? Will you forgive me of my sins? Will you make me new today? Will you transform my life in such a powerful way, just like that man that Pastor Mitch shared about at the altar? Would you transform my life today? Right where you're at, you can place your trust in Jesus. You can say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you are the resurrection of life. Would you resurrect my life so that I would spend eternity with you in heaven? Will you save me today? In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said... Amen. Come on, give God praise for his word today. I want this to resonate with you. Listen, if you just prayed to receive Christ on that connection card, check that off. Write that date down. Drop that off in one of the receptacles on your way out. Because I want to help you take your next step. So I want to tell you this. I hope this just resonates in you. Where does God want you to occupy that you've stopped occupying? That place that hell has tried to keep you out of. There's too much garbage over there, so you've just stayed out of it. It might be a relationship, it might be a mom, it might be a dad, it might be a a, a friend, it might be a neighbor, it might be a, a child. God's gonna ask for wisdom and he'll tell you how to get back in, in the right way. It might be a job or a career, it might be a dream that you've let go of, that that hell just said, nope, you're not gonna walk out that dream that God gave you. It might be a dream that God wants you to step back into, ask him, God, how do you want me to do this? And listen, because he'll say, no, not yet. Not yet, not yet. Just like he did with me that day going to that that business. Not yet, not yet, not yet. And then he'll say, go. And when you go, you'll see dead things come alive. Amen? Amen. Be blessed. Have an amazing week. If you need prayer today, we'd love to pray with you down front. 
can drop your offering and your connection card on the way out and uh, bless somebody. Ask them where their Judea is.